My name is Clayton Clark, and I am the General Manager for Green Mountain Transit. And I want to start by thanking you for being here. Um, you coming out and telling us about public transit uh, or how public transit is important to you is critical uh, for letting decision makers know um, that our community cares about bus service and how our potential service reductions uh, would impact you and the people that are important to you in your life. I next want to apologize that we're here at all. Um, GMT's employees, our board of commissioners believe in public transit. We want GMT to be more helpful to those we serve, not less. And I can assure you that nobody at GMT, whether employee or board member, wants to reduce service. I also want to make sure that folks know what GMT is. And so GMT is a municipality, just like the towns and cities that you live in. Our board of commissioners is made up of volunteers from your communities. They receive no compensation for the countless hours they volunteer to work in support of GMT. We are not a for-profit company. Uh, we are not considering service reductions um, to make money. We are considering service reductions because we're running out of money. We have no shareholders and we're not driven by the profit motive. We just need to be able to balance our budget. <clears throat> so I'd like to recognize uh, folks who are here. Um, I would uh, first starting off with our board members. And um, I see that some of them are um, continuing to join. And so if I miss somebody, I apologize. Uh, but we have uh, Catherine Dimitrik, uh, Andrea Souza, Bob Berman, um, I believe are the three board members that are with us today. Uh, thank you, uh, board members. This is their second meeting with us today as we had a, a board of directors meeting this morning at 7.30. And um, I wanted to uh, thank our employees that are here. And I don't see Curtis with the Teamsters, um, but he, uh, our, most of our employees are with the Teamsters and Curtis Clough um, and Ryan uh, with the Teamsters have been here for most of our meetings. And um, uh, so I wanna thank them for uh, being here. I wanna thank Dan Currier uh, from VTrans and Isaac Onos from Go Vermont. Uh, VTrans is also a supporter of public transit um, as evidenced by the fact that Vermont spends more per capita tax dollars on public transit than just about any other state. Uh, and importantly, Dan and Isaac can talk to attendees about the various programs VTrans and Go Vermont offer, and uh, they will present a little bit of information after uh, my remarks. I want to introduce Mary Claire Krogan uh, with Tri Valley Transit. Uh, one of the items that you'll hear about is that the 116 commuter is going to be transferring to Tri-Valley Transit. Um, we believe that transfer will happen on October 1st. And um, uh, currently, Tri-Valley tra Transit uh, runs two of the four uh, round trips on that route today, and they would be providing uh, the four. And we'll hear from them the potential uh, schedule that they're going to implement. For introductions, lastly, a little background on me. I came to GMT in 2023 after a career in human services. Um, all of the jobs that I had, uh, I worked with clients who used public transit. And so I came to GMT uh, seeing this very much as an extension of my career in human service. And right now, uh, I'm prepared to listen to you and all of the ways that our plan could impact you and the people that you care about um, because this is going to be critical information uh, for us to share. And so every comment made tonight uh, and throughout our public feedback process is going to be documented and packaged up for our Board of Commissioners, all of our municipal partners, VTRANS, and the legislature. So pretty much anyone who has a say in our funding will have access to the thoughts that you have here today. I do want to spend a few minutes to go through an overview of the plan. Um, I'm not going to go into the specifics of each potential cut because that would take uh, your time away to provide feedback. Um, you can, on our website, uh, find the plan. And uh, when you go to the main page uh, and you look under service alerts, you'll find uh, a page dedicated to uh, service reductions. So our plan lays out how to reduce um, our costs by $3 million by the end of fiscal year 2026. 
The situation that GMT is in is that the cost of providing service has increased faster uh, than our rise in revenue. Um, previously, we'd been able to use COVID relief funds uh, to fill that gap. Those funds are going to be uh, exhausted uh, in the next year. And, um, and so that is why we are in this situation. I will say that the good news for today is that even though we have a plan that could reduce uh, costs by $3 million, our current funding gap for fiscal year 26 is around $2 million. That means that if the current uh, cost and revenue projections hold, we will not have to implement all of the service reductions laid out. And um, I'm gonna talk a little bit now about um, how we develop the plan. And so we received input uh, from hundreds of survey results from riders, our municipal partners, uh, our bar board and employees. Um, these uh, uh, surveys had to deal with transit values and as far as how the service um, uh, should be prioritized. <laughs> and I can tell you in a nutshell, these surveys advised us to focus on local uh, service over commuter service, to focus on weekday service over weekend service, and to not reduce service where it serves the most riders. The flip side of, of this approach is that it does involve reducing or eliminating service where there are the fewest riders. And that's where we really wanna hear from you about how the impact uh, would happen to you if we were to eliminate or reduce that service. The plan is laid out in four phases. The first phase is already ongoing. And that includes the transfer of the 116 commuter to Tri-Valley Transit, um, as you mentioned, as I mentioned before, and as you'll, we'll hear from Mary Claire. It also uh, involved a reconfiguration of the neighborhood special routes that operate in Burlington during the school year. Um, those uh, consolidations of the neighborhood special routes um, meant that there was no loss in service. Um, and so for both of those uh, changes in the uh, first phase, uh, there's no loss of service associated with those savings. Uh, for the second phase, which potentially could happen in November or December of 2024 this year, uh, we would potentially eliminate the Jeffersonville commuter and reduce Saturday uh, local service. The Saturday service uh, reductions would be mostly in the evenings, although we would include the elimination of Saturday service on the number 10. The third phase that could happen in February or March 2025 uh, would focus on the St. Albans Link and Milton Commuter, as well as the Montpelier Link service. For the St. Albans Link and Milton Commuter, we are considering combining those routes into a single route. And for the Montpelier Link service, we are considering an overall reduction in the number of routes or number of routes. The fourth phase uh, would happen in June of 2025. Uh, this would be when most of uh, the biggest amount of service cuts would go into place. And this would focus on reductions in local service, which would include the eliminations of routes 10, uh, 11, and 8. It would also have further reductions to weekend service. Separate from the service reductions, we're also looking to increase the ADA fare from $3 to $4. Our ADA fare is the cost uh, for transportation provided by SSTA for riders who are eligible um, to receive ADA services because they live within three quarters of a mile of a fixed uh, route and they have a disability or condition uh, that makes using a fixed route service uh, not appropriate. And so this is for the door-to-door uh, -door, uh, service that SSTA operates. And I do want to recognize and thank um, Adam and Morgan uh, from SSTA for being here and um, um, appreciate that. And so we're getting to the point now where we're about to take your comments. But first, uh, we are going to uh, hear from uh, Mary Claire from Tri-Valley Transit to talk about the 116 commuter and then Dan and Isaac uh, from VTrans and uh, Go Vermont. So Mary Claire. Thank you, Clayton. Um, can everyone hear me and see the draft schedule that I've shared? Mm -hmm. Okay. So our aim is to make this transition um, on October 1st, 
and make it as seamless as possible for existing GMT riders. So we have used the arrival time in the morning at UVM Medical Center and Burlington Downtown Transportation Center as the anchor points for those extra runs that we're doing in the, the extra run we're doing in the morning. And then the reverse is true in the afternoon, we're aiming to get people home at the same time from those stops that they're currently um, riding. And from the perspective of Addison County residents, this transition equals an expansion because we are adding travel times for people who live in the, the communities of Middlebury, Bristol, and Starksboro. Um, so that's a, a way that we could potentially fill more seats and protect the longevity of this service. Um, so as you can see, the the morning run would leave from Middlebury Academy Street at 6.55. And then um, I'm blanking on which one is mine. Uh, do you? So we'll have two commuter runs in the afternoon heading up from Middlebury at 3.05 and 3.30. Mm -hmm. And um, like I said, it'll arrive at those places of employment at the same time where people are usually getting on the bus. That's about it. Um, I've got my contact info in the chat. If there are any questions and concerns that we don't, that you don't think of in this meeting, you're welcome to reach out to me later and I can follow up with you individually. Thank you so much, Mary Claire. You're welcome. And, and so um, if anyone what, would like to ask questions or provide comments during this meeting on the uh, the draft uh, schedule uh, for the 116, uh, please uh, feel free to do so. And um, I think Mary Claire, I would just ask you to stop sharing your screen for now, because I think that our uh, next folks are going to uh, need to use it. It's said that I didn't. Sam Sarah said that I didn't. Close. And now we're going to be turning uh, it over to uh, Dan Carrier and Isaac Onos. Thanks, Clayton. Isaac Gold. Get the slides set up. Yep. Take it away. Uh, Thanks again. Uh, just a thumbs up, Clayton, that you can see this uh, Go Vermont slide. Lovely. Um, yep. Uh, my name is Isaac Onis. I am an outreach coordinator for Go Vermont and just spend a couple minutes chatting about a couple of our program features. Um, so, Go Vermont is a free statewide transportation resource program. We are a VTrans program. One of our marquee features is our trip planner. This can both be accessed via our website, connectedcommuters.org, or through the App Store as the Go Vermont app. It is a feature that helps folks find rides, including carpooling, van pooling, public transit. It also has biking and walking directions. We also have the guaranteed ride home benefit. This is a safety measure so that for whatever, if you are commuting via carpool or any of the sustainable modes as a Go Vermont member, and for whatever reason it falls through, we will reimburse travel fees, including a taxi or Uber ride up to $70. And this can be done four times per year. Um, there's also a small incentive and rewards program for logging trips on the Go Vermont Trip Planner. I'm, all, I'm going to share very quickly a screenshot showing in the Trip Planner. If you were to look for a trip between Essex Junction and Burlington, you can see here that already there are 16 available carpools. Uh, it shows the available public transit routing, and then it shows walking and cycling directions. Currently, based on the filters ahead, there are no van pools here, but um, oftentimes van pools are set within kind of the organizational parameters uh, specified within Go Vermont. And then just talking quickly about our van pool program, which is called Commuter Co-op. Uh, this is a program in which 
coworkers or folks in a the same or or same geographic area, uh, both living or commuting to, uh, meaning a large employer or even potentially a set of employers in an area, uh, come together and we help with the coordinating. Um, work with us with a state provided vehicle. We provide a seventy five percent subsidy for the first three months, and then a fifty percent subsidy of the cost of the vehicle thereafter. Uh, we also provide free snow tires and maintenance with that. Here is our contact information. If you want to learn more info, go Vermont at vermont.gov. Our website, again, is connectingcommuters.org. And this QR code, uh, if you scan it, uh, it will get you right to the trip planner. Thank you so much, uh, Isaac. So we're now gonna be moving to taking your comments. And so if uh, somebody would like to make a comment, please raise your hand. Um, staff will keep track of the order and then we'll call upon folks when it's their turn. And uh, um, so I will say that with the number of folks that we have here, um, I, I'm not gonna set an official time limit, uh, but please keep your um, remarks uh, to you know about three minutes and um, uh, so that we can make sure that everybody has an opportunity to speak, especially for folks who are joining us on their lunch breaks uh, and may have to uh, return back uh, to work shortly. Um, I do also want to make sure folks know that we will continue to accept uh, written feedback up until the board makes its final service decisions, which will either be at the October 15th or November 12th board meeting. Um, I also expect that, especially for the uh, changes that will be happening in June of next year, uh, that we will continue to work with uh, municipalities and the public on refining what those uh, changes may be. And, uh, and so we will continue to work on this uh, after November as well. So with that said, uh, Jamie, if I could have you identify uh, who is the first to start, and I'm going to get into listening mode. So thank you so much. Sure, Chad Simmons, go ahead. Yes, thanks so much. Uh, just first off, I really appreciate what you all are doing and appreciate the, the complexity and the challenge of having to, to uh, figure out how to do all of what you do uh, within budget. So um, my name is Chad Simmons, he, him pronouns. I live in Montpelier and I work in Burlington a couple of days a week. Um, I, our family is a one car family. Uh, we try going to two cars, but uh, difficult to afford two cars uh, at this juncture. Um, I heavily, heavily rely on the number 86 link from Montpelier to Burlington and back. Um, in fact, I would was gonna actually advocate uh, for more routes uh, to be added during the day to make it uh, flexible for um, uh, travel to and from Montpelier to Burlington. Um, I am just asking uh, some reconsideration of the, the planned reductions and or cut to the uh, number 86 line um, and ask for some creative financing if possible um, to, to figure out ways in which to keep that opportunity available. I know a number of people use it for work, also to get uh, from Montpelier or Central Vermont to UVM Medical Center. Um, I use it sometimes as well to get to the airport or um, to travel. So um, it would be a huge disruption for our family, both financially and logistically, um, if that is not available. So just ask that you reconsider the reduction to that service. Um, finally, um, if there are any legislators um, or um, uh, federal delegation on the line, I encourage you to invest in our public infrastructure. Um, I think it is unrealistic to ask um, uh, a public uh, infrastructure like public transportation to be in the black uh, without substantial financial uh, contributions from our state and federal coffers. Um, I think we need to invest more in our public infrastructure, not less. Um, and I encourage you all to think about how um, we'll need to meet all of our policy goals in the future um, with more 
public transit, not less. So thank you so much and appreciate your op the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much, Chad. And if I could just do a follow-up question, when you take the 86 into Burlington, do you take it all the way to the transit center or are you getting off uh, before then? I usually take it, uh, I'd say 99% of the time to the transportation center. Sometimes if I have a meeting um, closer to UVM, I get off earlier. Um, uh, so, but mostly to the transportation center. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Chad. Jamie, who's next? Stephen Finner. Dr. Finner, welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you uh, for giving people the opportunity to comment. Uh, I want to second the comments of the first uh, person who spoke and uh, lobby for restoring the 11. Uh, it enables us to get to the airport. It enables people coming into the airport to leave the airport. It's very convenient. And uh, without it, we get to the transit center and then we have to find an alternative means to get to the airport and which can also be pricey. Uh, I am not a frequent user of the 86, but I certainly would be willing to pay five, six or seven dollars for a trip up to Burlington. Uh, I know that that may not be affordable for other users of the 86, but perhaps uh, a, a fare structure can also be re-examined and, uh, you know, just re-examined and maybe some adjustments made. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Finner. Thank you for joining us today. And Jamie, I'm sorry if I mispronounced Ina. I think that's me. Yes. Yeah. Elena Greenberg here. They, them pronouns. I'm based in Burlington. I am a huge fan of GMT. Thank you all for your hard work. Such a devoted public transit user. I do not have a car. And I'm on the Montpelier link once, twice, three times a week. Um, this bus is a too well-kept secret. I am astonished every time I get on this bus and it's not full of people. I know because I'm on the highway, on the bus, looking at everybody driving their cars, that a bunch of other people are also doing this commute. And I, I really want to encourage, I know others have already said this, we actually need more service on this bus. And I, I want to see GMT really investing in the outreach that we need to do such that everybody else on the highway is actually on the bus instead. Um, this, this kind of regional access to transit is so essential to getting cars off the road for those middle distance journeys. Urban service is also really essential, which I'll say more about in a minute, but just... I, that's a 45 minute drive that I don't have to do and I can't do because I don't have a car. And I know that there is a huge opportunity to bring in a lot more ridership and a lot more fares on routes like this. Um, and maybe weekend service, maybe evening service. If I go to Montpelier and I miss the 6 p.m. bus, I'm stuck in Montpelier. Um, so just thinking about this route is a huge opportunity and the last thing we should be doing is cutting it and the first thing we should be doing i think is is making this huge resource accessible to people the probably i don't know hundreds maybe thousands of commuters who are who are traveling this route multiple times a week and then just in terms of of urban service the city loop the airport bus Chittenden County should be an urban and peri-urban center of our state, and public transit is such an essential part of that. This is like this is this the future of our county and the future of our state at stake when we when we gut public transit that connects these much more suburban parts of Chittenden County to Burlington. We really need these places to be moving forward into a climate resilient future together and having public transit that that pulls us in into that future is so necessary. We're never going to meet our climate goals. We're never going to get cars off the road. We're never going to do the placemaking that we need to do that happens when people are on the bus together, when they're meeting each other, when they're sharing space. Um, all of that transformation is never going to happen if we just have people driving back and forth on, on Route 2 um, and on 89. So just really here to advocate for more service, not less. It is public transit <coughs> that makes our 
communities vibrant and possible when we have people who don't have cars, who don't want to drive, who can't drive. Um, and and that's the that's the place I want to live in for the rest of my life. So this is not just about one budget cycle. Um, this is about I know you all are working really hard to establish long-term sources of funding. I heard from some of my state reps recently that the gas tax is not bringing in as much as, as it used to, which is great, right? Like, let's keep taxing gas and, and combustion engines in a way that is both, like, responsive to, to the budgets of working class Vermonters and also reflects, like, th we should be disincentivizing that mode of transit and using it to fund our public transit networks. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Lena. Appreciate that. Dale? Thank you. So I want to start by um, just kind of endorsing everything that we've already heard. Um, I, too, am a Montpelier link rider. I live in Burlington. And um, I, one thing that I think is important, um, not just for GMT, because I expect that you already know this, but but in terms of your advocacy, is to point out the, the value to employers um, who are having trouble staffing up so many jobs are, are um, you know, going unfilled. And the fact that GMT makes it possible for us to get to jobs that otherwise might not be convenient, like I, for one, never would have worked in Montpelier uh, as a Burlington resident, if I had to do that drive every day, or even if I had to do it as a carpool, um, but as a bus ride, it worked just fine for me. And I think that, that that's true for a lot of employers, that they benefit from this. And I hope that's one thing that you'll think about. And um, another thing that I think is going to be really important, and I'm worried that these service cuts coming now will kind of create a timing problem is with Burlington having just eliminated the parking minimums, and, and maybe that was statewide, I'm not sure, but as more properties get developed without space for parking, people are going to expect there to be adequate bus service. And um, I just, I, I want to make sure that we are looking at this um, not just the dollars and cents of how much does the state need to subsidize this service right now, but in the longer term, how do we develop and make sure that, that the whole system is working, the whole transportation system of which buses are a part and of which parking is a part. And when we get rid of that parking because it's smarter land use and makes housing more affordable, we need to make sure that, that the folks who are living there have a good way to get around. Uh, the last thing that I want to add is that my kids grew up riding the neighborhood specials. And then when they went to high school out on North Avenue, taking the city bus to get out there. And when they realized that they could get around on the bus systems as, you know, um, 13, 14, 15 year old kids who weren't yet old enough to drive, it was such an important sense of freedom for them um, that they could now go visit friends who lived in Shelburne or something like that by taking the bus there. And um, I think that's another big piece of it as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dale. I appreciate making that connection uh, uh, to folks who don't have driving as an option. Jamie, who's next? Jenny. Thank you very much. And I wanted to say thank you for having this meeting on Zoom as an option for those of us who can't get to the in-person meetings. It's very much appreciated. Um, I just wanted to add in to what several people said. I ride the Montpelier link. Um, I live in Burlington and work in Montpelier. And I definitely rely on it um, to get to work. I know sometimes I've seen, um, not in this meeting per se, but in other places, people refer to riders of that bus as being choice riders, so-called choice riders, um, as assuming they have another way to get to the location, uh, that they own a car and they simply choose to take the bus. And of course, the reality is that's not the case. Um, there are people on that bus that either due to health reasons or economic reasons have no other way to get to where they're going, whether it's to Montpelier or to Burlington, whichever direction they're going in. Um, 
And certainly I recognize that the financials are, are very bad, but um, I'm very, very hopeful that that route does not get cut entirely. Um, besides being a disaster for me, it would also be really bad for the place I work because there are other people that take it. And we're having enough trouble hiring people as it is. Um, and I think that would only get worse. Um, but again, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jenny. Certainly our concerns about the impact on uh, the economics are, are, are is what we're hearing loud and clear from folks. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, Asta? Hi, I'm Asta. My pronouns are they, them. Um, I live off of the six in uh, South Burlington. And like some of the other people were talking, um, I don't own a car. The bus is my only means of transportation. And for me, that means independence, like being able to do things like whatever I need to, whenever I need to. And as a disabled person, like that's really like important to me is maintaining that independence. And what I've seen so far is uh, like with the six route and also with some of the 11 route changes is limiting people's access to places like the airport, for instance, or the ability to work downtown as a service worker at night on the weekend, for instance. And um, that basically like removes my ability to do those sorts of things. And so for instance, the removing the Saturday night routes um, would make it so that it's a four mile walk back and forth, um, which isn't really um, feasible like ongoing um, into the winter time. That's all, thank you. Thank you so much. Mike? Hi, thanks for the opportunity. Um, my name is Mike Glott. I work with Howard Center. And um, we have some concerns about the ability of a lot of our clients to get to appointments with us. Um, I think the, the 11 is one of the main areas of concern, but we're still, um, we're still kind of looking at this and seeing how many riders we have who are coming in for, for treatment and service. And I wonder if you could make recommendations other than speaking at a meeting like this, um, once we're able to get our arms a bit better around quantifying the impact, how, how can we advocate? Should we write to your board? Should we write, should we, who should we write to or call? Great question. And so one of the things that we handed out um, at our in-person meetings was a little slip of paper that had the contact information uh, for some of the the uh, the principals uh, that will be uh, involved in this. And so starting with uh, the state administration, uh, uh, I would recommend writing to uh, VTRANS uh, via the governor's office. Um, and you can find uh, Governor Scott's um, uh, ways to contact him through uh, his website. Similarly, uh, legislators who are um, uh, at the State House on both sides of the House and the Senate, uh, particularly Transportation Committee members, and, and their information is, um, is uh, available on their website. Uh, lastly, I would recommend, um, uh, separate from these hearings, uh, reaching out to your municipal uh, 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 managers and potentially the city and select boards, or the city councils and select boards, uh, because they're going to have some difficult decisions uh, about their own funding levels and contributions to, to GMT. Um, and so for them to hear the importance would be good uh, uh, as well. Um, what I can tell you is that the materials uh, um, that you send to us, um, even if it is out of this uh, process, so that say uh, two weeks from now, uh, you have here's a, a number of all of the people that would be impacted by uh, uh, not easy access to the San Remo Drive location, um, uh, we will still go ahead and put that into our public comment packages, even if it doesn't come in uh, through one of these. And, and those packages will end up going to uh, uh, those folks mentioned as well. And so please, uh, what I would say is, um, it's the old joke that they used to say about voting, you know, vote early and often. Um, I would say when it comes to uh, providing uh, your comment, uh, do it early and often. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Barbara? Mm -hmm. Oh, Barbara, we can't Barbara, hear you. You're on mute. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. Better? Yes. Okay. So 
again, thank you all for all the attendees and for all the people involved in this and all the GMT personnel. Um, I live along the Route 11 um, bus route and used to take it all the time. But when the changes of the scheduling changed, I could never remember when the bus was coming. So I stopped using it. Uh, but now that it's, but I miss it. Now that it goes out to the airport, I think that's an important route to maintain. And some of the other people have said why, um, not just for people in Burlington, for people all around our state, but also um, I'm thinking about the Amtrak train as well, that people need to be able to get there as well as, well as other cultural places where um, the buses run, whether it's Shelburne Museum or Echo, uh, the list is endless. Um, I also wanna thank the person who asked about who to contact. I just took notes on what you said, so that was helpful. Um, I was also wondering if you might speak to some of, um, if there are any other route combinations that could be made. Um, for example, um, gosh, I can't remember, the city loop and maybe 11. Mm -hmm. um, just for an example, or Essex going up to the hospital and coming from there um, is an important place. Certainly the hospital is a place that people need to get to and University Health Center. Um, so I think those, oh, has any exploration been done on some of the routes that have less people on them to maybe have smaller buses? Um, I think that might be helpful. It would still give drivers um, employment um, and meet the needs of um, the people that use the buses, but sometimes the buses aren't crowded and or timing schedules for different sized buses too. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm done. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Barbara. Um, I will tell you that, um, you know, and we actually talked about this at the GMT board meeting today, is that making sure that we don't lose sight that um, changes um, uh, are also opportunities for improvement. And so I, I do want to, to let you know that there's certain uh, modifications to routes uh, that we would be potentially uh, making to limit some of the impact. And so I'm going to just throw out some examples of what we're considering, but I want to make sure everybody knows uh, that, uh, you know, that these are uh, still very much in consideration. Things like extending the number two so that it would go to the Essex experience. Uh, we're now at stops at the Amtrak uh, there. If we were to eliminate the 10, um, you know, having that uh, extension uh, would limit the negative impact. Um, similarly, uh, one of the long-term goals for folks in Winooski um, has been having the number nine connect to the Shaws that's on the hill in Colchester, just outside of uh, Winooski. And so we are going to be trying to uh, address some of those uh, changes um, uh, uh, when we have the opportunities. I also want to um, take a moment to ask or answer the question about uh, buses because uh, the size of the buses. Um, this is a, a question that we frequently get, and I can tell you that when my first week here, um, uh, I asked the same question. And so uh, one of the things that we need to keep in mind when it comes to uh, our buses is that it's the only portion of uh, our costs um, that is cheaper uh, uh, between operating a large bus and a smaller bus is, is the fuel. Um, it's still the same cost for the driver. Um, it's still the, the overhead costs are... Uh, are um, uh, are the same. And so uh, that's one of the reasons why we've uh, standardized our fleet. And so that any urban bus can run any urban bus route. Uh, one of the things that frequently happens, uh, for example, in, in July, um, we had a bus catch on fire breakdown, you know, and, and uh, we had to quickly, you know, get another bus, you know, out running that route. And uh, by having all of the buses um, be able to run all of the uh, the lines that just improves that flexibility 
uh, where we don't have to worry about, oh, you know, we need a specific size bus for a specific route. Um, but uh, 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 certainly that was a, a question that we hear often. And so I wanted to take the time to let folks know. And um, uh, the other thing I wanted to let folks know that's part of that equation is that I think of our buses, they're, they're more like ships than cars. Um, you know, the, the big city buses, they have a lifespan of 12 years. And the smaller buses generally have a, a lifespan that's half of that. And their cost is roughly half that of a full-size city bus. So what you find is, is that the, the, the actual purchasing of the buses themselves, uh, it doesn't save us money by, by purchasing a smaller vehicle than, than it would be the full size. So thank you so much for asking uh, those questions, Barbara. And uh, Jamie, is it Kevin next? Kevin. Mm -hmm. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. And um, I really appreciate the GMT and everyone who's here representing the organization on the call. Um, just to clarify, I'm, I'm in South Burlington and I don't particularly represent any organization or who I work for, just my individual views. But um, similar to uh, what Steve mentioned, uh, I rely pretty heavily on the 11 personally and definitely utilize it for both um, work and the airport. And um, I don't have a formed thought as eloquently as many of the other speakers today, but I just want to echo sentiment mentioned previously and also add the perspective that um, maybe if, if at all possible, um, it, might be something to consider that the um, phase four changes are maybe postponed to a later date, just from the perspective of, um, you know, next summer, uh, Burlington very heavily relies on student populations or um, professionals after training moving in. At, during the summertime, and there are a lot of big shifts in housing. So I'm curious how some of these changes might impact people who are recently moved to Burlington or the surrounding areas and um, maybe just might not be in the loop quite as much for um, some of these changes. Um, and yeah, well, that's... That's pretty much all the thought that I have, but um, thanks so much for letting me chime in and um, I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. And uh, you know, one of the things that we've heard uh, repeatedly during the public meeting process is that the location of public transit um, has, been, has been part of the decision-making uh, that people have made about where they live. And uh, we've had lots of folks say, hey, I picked this apartment or this house because it's on the bus line. And, you know, and if you if you move uh, the bus line, I'm going to have to move. And so that's what I would say um, uh, as far as the potential impact uh, for people next summer. Uh, we know that there's a housing crisis. We know that uh, that housing crisis means that people are frequently traveling long distance away from the or in living in away from the urban area and then traveling into the urban area. And so really, you know, things like the Jeffersonville commuter um, uh, going away will limit uh, where people can, you know, seek to find housing to, to travel into Burlington. Uh, so absolutely, I, I see that as being an impact. Do we have anyone else with their hands up? Not at the moment. While we um, um, uh, give people a moment, I do want to thank uh, some of the folks that have uh, came on since the beginning. Uh, we have uh, another uh, of our board members, uh, Chapin Kaner. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, also want to uh, point out that uh, we have um, the, uh, what I, how I refer to as the original James Smith, uh, with uh, who is the transportation uh, director uh, at um, uh, UVM. Thank you, uh, James, for joining us. I think I saw Sandy before from uh, CATMA. 
I don't know if she's still on uh, the line, but the, the Chittenden uh, Area Transportation Management Association, uh, Sandy is uh, 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 and Katma are important partners with us. Um, and uh, so glad that they were able to make it. Um, and definitely Dan, Jimmy, Corey, um, you know, all of the staff uh, here at GMT, um, thanks for being here and listening to this because I know that, you know, we're going to be taking these comments um, and, and using that to ad advise our uh, our path forward. Hey, hey, and uh, with a little extra time, we got some more uh, hands up. And so, Jamie, who's uh, first? Sarah. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh so I want to also jump on the uh, 11 support bus. Um, I live in South Burlington. I work at UVM. I take the bus every weekday to and from. Um, parking on campus is abysmal. This allows me to not to that not or have to pay for the parking passes. Um, I've also been a uptick in students taking the 11 bus. A lot of students take it to and from campus and the U-Mall to go to Target and get stuff that they need. Um, and with the new graduate housing in South Burlington around Market Street, I think it is, um, a lot of those grad and medical students are now also taking the bus into onto campus as well. Um, so I know a lot of them probably aren't up because they're new to town, new to college. Um, but I have seen that uptick in, in usage, and I just wanted to mention on their behalf because um, they are the population of this area. Um, and I too have used the bus to go um, from the airport home. I've used it to go get down to Amtrak. I've used it to go to jury duty um, in Burlington. So having the whole length of the 11 route has been a life stream for me it, like to and from town so those are my two things thank you so much sarah thank you. i uh normally when i travel to the uvm i enjoy our bus service so i don't have to worry about parking i had a meeting there recently where i was coming from out of our service area and I had to drive and oh my god i the parking finding a parking spot was a, a challenge so Jenny. Um, Jenny. Thank you very much for the um, contact information as far as the legislature and everything, because I will absolutely be doing that. Um, I know you have another public meeting. I think it's um, tonight or something like that. I just mm -hmm. wanted to ask, um, after these public meetings are done and everything, what happens then? Where does this go at that point? Great, great question. And so um, what happened is, is that we uh, have already started the process of, of collecting the information and, and gathering it for our board to consider. Um, they're going to be meeting um, uh, over the next few months uh, to take that feedback in. And they are then going to, uh, prior to November 15th, um, have a, uh, a, a service reduction plan uh, that needs to be included in a report that we are going to be providing to the legislature. And so one of the things that I would expect um, is that the further away uh, uh, the plan is, probably the less specificity. And so, um, so if we are gonna have uh, reductions in November and December, I would imagine that plan will be very specific about exactly what would be cut and when, uh, because it would be you know, in the not too distant future. Um, similarly, in February and March, we would probably have some specifics uh, but then we'll still have things for us to work out. And then for the June changes, I imagine that there will be more broad concepts of what we'll be working towards. And um, uh, and really, the thing that's going to make um, this situation uh, stressful uh, 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 for our riders uh, and for ourselves internally is that we really won't uh, have a great idea of uh, what our state funding uh, will look like. Uh, until the April or May timeframe of 2025. Um, and that's when uh, the annual transportation bill um, uh, makes it through the, the House and the Senate. 
And so what that means is, is that we might have, um, a, thank you, Kevin, have a good day. We might have, um, uh, you know, no, we won't have clarity on exactly what cuts will and won't be happening uh, until until spring of 2025. And, and, uh, uh, and so I just want people to know that this is still going to be a work in progress. Um, and that our intention um, is, is going to be to um, cut enough service to fill the gap uh, that we have between our income and our revenue. And I, I don't suspect that, you know, we're not going to cut more service than, uh, than required. So our hope is to, to limit uh, the reductions as much as possible. And, uh, and so I see that we have uh, additional hands up now. Can I just add one very quick thing, Clayton? Um, Dale had asked this in the chat, and I'll just mention for folks who didn't see, we are working to schedule another public meeting in Montpelier um, mm -hmm. and potentially another local public meeting. Um, we're just trying to figure out the dates and timing for that. And once we have that, we will announce um, those additional public meetings, um, especially recognizing that we have lots of link riders uh, on the call today. Yes. Barbara? Hi, uh, thanks for letting me speak again. Um, the woman that spoke before asked my question of what the follow-up to this will be. Um, it would be nice to have another Zoom option also. And um, for something that you said, I moved to Burlington from New York City and was used to a vibrant bus system. That was 29 years ago. And I picked Burlington because of the bus system, which has increased so much. And I want to thank you for that. And the drivers are fabulous. That's all I want to say. Thank Thanks. you so much. Um, you know, something I should have mentioned is that um, if there's substantive changes to this plan, uh, <clears throat> then we'll have another hearing process. And so, uh, so I my guess is is that we're probably going to be continuing to have public meetings, uh, you know, from here through next June, um, as we refine our work and uh, need to then put it out to the public to get people's uh, input on it. James, thank you. Um, I don't want to take up too much time here, but I just you know wanted to assure folks who are within the UVM umbrella that. Um, we are actively engaged, uh, you know, a number of different departments from UVM transportation to um, our sustainability to our planning departments um, and our transportation management association, CAPMA, um, are, are engaged on a level with GMT. We're looking at analyzing data. Thank you, GMT, for giving us ridership data. Um, and we'll continue to provide, you know, feedback uh, to GMT um, you know, we're encouraging all of our constituents to to engage in the public discourse on this. I think that's the bedrock of you know a democratic process and a, and a good piece of learning just in general for our community. Um, and whatever ends up happening, it won't be for a lack of creative idea sharing and communication between UVM and GMT. So, thanks everyone. Thanks GMT. Thank you, James. Aurora. Hi, um, a couple of things, I guess. Um, I am a disabled rider of GMT, and I recently moved to Burlington from uh, other parts of the state because of GMT being here. Um, so I'm now very stressed because now I'm thinking, okay, now I have to move again, probably out of state. Um, and I'm looking for work and realizing I can't take a job on one of these um, towns because I won't necessarily have transportation to get there. And Voc Rehab is able to help a little bit with that, but they actually only help for the first 30 days of your job. And then you need to have figured something out like a bus route. Um, so this is really going to have a huge impact on a lot of people, but especially disabled people, especially with taking the SSTA fare up and with that, especially with having the disabled community and the really the poorest people in our community who don't have economic access to another vehicle. Um, I can't help but feel like we're really cutting services that are crucial for people who don't have any other options. Um, and to be honest, the fact that the one Zoom option for giving public comment is at noon on a Tuesday doesn't seem to be in line with supporting those communities either, because those are often the people who do not have a lunch break at 12 on an 
Tuesday to jump on a Zoom call. So I really hope that if there are more meetings, um, the Zoom call could also be scheduled in the evening like the other ones were. Thanks. Aurora, great feedback. Thank you so much for that. And Jamie, anyone else? Oh, Gabrielle. Mm -hmm. Hi, thanks for posting this. Uh, so I'm still currently a state representative, um, although I'm, I did not run again. So I, I will be passing the torch to someone in January. Um, I, you know, my first term I was in house transportation. This has been an ongoing issue for, for some time. I guess I, you know, the, the part that I've always struggled with is the fact that uh, it seems like we are able to spend, you know, so many hundreds of millions of dollars on on the roads that uh, those of us who have cars are able to use and the bridges uh, and all of that. And yet um, the area that we uh, can't figure out how to support um, is the uh, public transit, which is when all the folks who can't afford cars or for whatever reason, you know, um, if if they can't drive, are you know that's their only option. And I I know I'm preaching to the choir when I speak with the employees at GMT about that, um, but I will continue to try and make that argument um, with my peers uh, in the legislature. And and you know it's it's not that there's so much match that goes on. So when you look at the T-bill and you look at how much is spent on public roads and, and, and shared infrastructure, it's not really like it's all coming from Vermont, uh, you know, pockets. Um, so much of it is federal match, but it's still disproportional how much we can put the Vermont state dollars into the resources that those of us who can afford to own our cars use and not the resources that, that are uh, supporting public transit, um, that those who have less end up having to bear the brunt as usual. So I appreciate your work. Uh, if I can be supportive uh, externally come January, please let me know. Thank you so much, Representative Stevens. Okay. Any other thoughts? Well, I started by thanking you for being here. And I wanna end by thanking you for being here. Um, every one of these public meetings has uh, included uh, feedback from you all that has uh, sort of added to my perspective or changed my perspectives. Um, I, I love the, the surprising uh, way things come up. Like when we heard from people today um, about the 86, you know, frequently we think about people traveling from Montpelier to Burlington and we forget about, oh, there's also people from Burlington going to Montpelier. And uh, and so I just appreciate uh, uh, the, sort of the group um, collection of uh, intelligence um, and, and being able to tap into that uh, uh, to address this situation. So thank you all for participating. Um, and uh, if you haven't uh, done it already, please make sure uh, to include uh, your name in the chat so that when we um, uh, so that when we do our documentation for who said what um, to provide to folks that uh, that we can uh, have your comments uh, correctly attributed. So I think that uh, unless there's uh, any other last closing comments, I'm going to thank you all for being here. I hope that the weather still is going to be good for the rest of the day and uh, that you enjoy yourself. So thank you so much.